Hallelujah. Father, we commit this time and I pray, Lord, that as we look at your word, as we study your word this morning, I know you're bringing us on a journey. And as we heard, there is revival taking inside of us. For Lord, we are looking always on the outside for greater things. And sometimes the greater things must happen on the inside before they can happen on the outside. And we thank you that this is a season of revival, transformation and greater things you are doing on the inside of us. Making us look more like you so we can give more of you to this world that is desperate for a savior. Hallelujah. Therefore move, give us hearts and minds to hear what you're saying this morning. To quicken our spirits. I pray Lord that, uh, uh, that our spirits will connect with your spirit this morning. And that we will hear and see everything you want us to see. In Jesus name. Amen. You know, I was, I was sitting there and thinking, you know, um, the Sunday sermons that have been uh, spoken about in the last couple of months, um, you know, they're not, they're not, um, sometimes I look at them and say, but Lord, they're not, they're, what do I say? Um, focusing on the plight people are in and shouldn't they be uh, sermons about you know uh, about how God feels sorry for you and this for you and that for you and and what I heard the Lord saying listen in this season I'm, I'm not putting plasters on wounds I'm not putting plasters on wounds but I'm transforming you it's it's uh, what, what is that famous uh, proverb is it don't give a man a fish but teach him how to fish there is no, God is not giving us little hands outs right now. But he's saying, I want to change you so you don't live in that same place looking for handouts. But I'm going to transform you so you were walking in victory. You know, he's, there's a transformation that is taking place here. Right? And I believe if we do, again, this is not anything clever I'm doing. It is only what I hear God saying for me and for us. Right? This is what I believe God is saying to me and for us. So uh, let's track with him. I believe as we continue in what God is saying, remember we began with heavenly perspective. If we continue with heavenly perspective, what is God saying and doing, then all those things, areas where we need and where we want to feel sorry for ourselves, God will deal with. Right? Remember that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything that you need will be added unto you. Amen. So last week, I want us to know, um, as we looked at last week, every one of us is called by God to be, to be what? Those of you who are here, you have forgotten, right? That you need to answer. Fruitful, fruitful. And the amazing thing, uh, you know, as, as, as I was re-looking at, 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 at the sermon, uh, as I, I, I tell the children, um, there are days I, 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 I preach to record and then I have to listen. I have to listen to my own sermon because God is speaking to me. And very often the things I say while the recording is going on is not even in my notes. So I, I really need to hear that, right? But what I want us to understand, something that really encouraged me is this, in, in, in John chapter 15, which we looked at, is, is that the fact that God has not only put us to abide with Christ, but He prunes us because He knows we have the capacity for more. And that for me is so exciting that for each one of us, we can all confidently say, yeah, I know, I know the pruning times. I know the pruning times. But listen church, hereafter pruning time is not for self-pity, and wallowing in that, oh poor me, but to say no, God believes I can produce more. God has so much more for me. And I want you to see that that is you. Whether you are here, whether you are watching, that is you. God looks at you and says you will produce more. You have the capacity. And that's why I have chosen you and called you. Right. And in that mindset, I want us to look at today's message which is... Um, what do I say? He spoke about fruitfulness, which is a very pruning message. So, I don't know, if you need to take painkillers, take it now. 
If you need a painkiller, take it now. A spiritual painkiller because this is a pruning message. Because even when I was preparing it, it was pruning me. It was pruning me and I was like, ouch, ouch. It's an ouch message in this day and age. It's a pruning for bearing more. Okay? It's a pruning for bearing more. Right? So, as we're talking about bearing fruit... Let me ask you, where do you think God has placed you to bear fruit? Where has God placed you six days out of the seven days of the week to bear fruit? That's an important question to answer. Where has He called you out of the seven days of the week? I have to get my math right. I put six fingers up. Seven days of the week. Where do you think God has placed you to bear fruit? Is it in this building? Some of you, yes. See, again, I'm, I'm talking about mentality. Where is your mentality? What, what is your mindset? I want us to see today that the greatest place of bearing fruit Besides, we spoke about internal fruit and then external fruit, right? Last Sunday, we looked at internal fruit, fruit of repentance, fruit of the Holy Spirit. All that is internal, what the Spirit of God does, the more we surrender to Him, right? But then with that, Jesus said, I've chosen you and appointed you that you may go, that you may go and bear fruit, right? So there is a going and bearing fruit. But where do we begin right now? Where we are right now? You begin where you are, besides on Sunday, from Monday to Saturday, where are you? Can I tell you, that is where God wants you. That is, is your field to bear fruit. We are placed to bear fruit that glorify Him. But guess what? To many of us, for, for those of, I mean, we don't have children here, barring two, uh, it's school. And you ask any child, how many of you think school is a fun, nice place? It's going to be a very small percentage that will say, yeah, school is really nice. Majority will say, no, we don't like school. We don't like school. We don't like working. We don't like studying. We like playing, but we don't like all the other things. We love holidays. I'm, I'm going somewhere. I want you to track with me. As adults, when I say work, how many of you get excited about work? I love work versus work. See, there is a mindset, again, majority of us, not all, majority, there, are, there is a handful who actually like working. But I'm talking to the majority, the rest of us, who work is... Uh, it's not something we like. We glorify rest. Took your painkillers, right? We glorify as Christians also. The world glorifies, very often Christians included. We glorify rest. We glorify rest. To most of all, rest is the thing that we look forward to. It's the most joyful thing. Are you holidays? Yes! More holidays, the happier I am. The more rest, uh, the more holidays I can go on, the more rest I can have, the more joyful I am. Our mentality is, a Monday to Friday, let's just get this over with. TGIF! Thank God it's Friday! What is that mindset? I hate Monday to Friday. It's Friday evening. It's the weekend. I glorify my rest. Please track with me. Because this is how most of us live. Including me. That's why I said, ouch! I took painkillers from last evening. I've been on painkillers. The Monday blues. Oh God, Monday, here we go again. I live for the weekend. What is this mindset? That is the mindset of the majority of us. Work is something we want to run away. Why am I saying all this? 
if that is our mindset, how on earth can we bear fruit Monday to Friday or Saturday? If that is our mindset, how on earth do you think you will ever bear fruit where God has placed you? Hmm. Where did you stab yourself? Where did the word hit you? I'm not just talking about those who have jobs. I'm talking about those of you who are mothers. Those of you who are not in offices, but you're at home and doing stuff. Where on earth, If you hate Monday to Saturday and you just wait for that Sunday, that little pocket that we have of little worship and a little this and, oh, I feel so good on that day. I've been called to bear fruit. See, what sticks in people's minds is work equals a curse. Working is a curse. Where does that come from? It comes from Genesis chapter 3. Right? Then, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you. Now guys, don't say, see, that's, the pro- that's why I don't listen to you. Don't tell your wives that. Right? That, is not, that is not the purpose of this message. The purpose of the message is, why on earth you know, did you stand as a, as, a, as, as a man of God? Right? Uh, but you have heeded the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Therefore, cursed is the ground. What is cursed? The ground for your sake. In toil, in work, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face and you shall eat bread. See, we read this and we think work is a curse. We think work is a curse. Here, he cursed, he cursed work. No, 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 no. He did not curse work. He cursed the ground. Now track with me. Now can I tell you, because of sin, everything has consequences and had an impact. Work, I believe, would have been much easier. But now the ground is hard. Work became harder after sin. Relationships became harder after sin. I want you to know, the number of the health became harder after sin. Are you with me? See, everything changed from the perfection God made after sin. But we don't hate everything. You don't think of retiring from everything, do you? I don't want to retire from my marriage. But when it comes to work, I can't wait for this to end. Think about this. Those of us who, are, who can say, uh, listen, I'm, I'm wealthy enough, so I can't wait. I've earned enough, so I can't wait to retire, so I can just relax for the rest of my life. Why is that? Because we don't really like work. Work is awful. Work is awful. See, a lot of things got affected by sin, but God did not curse work. God did not curse work. And I'm telling you, there has to be an absolute transformation in you and I today. That's why I'm saying, let him prune you. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying and surrender to him. We heard today, at the cross there was obedience. There was surrendering to God's will. Not my will, but yours be done. So I wait on the cross. Can I tell you, there is victory in surrendering to the things of God. There is victory when you obey the word of God. Now, it may not make sense. I love That's what I'm saying. I'm sitting there, Lord. Every single chorus is going to help me in the sermon today. Because it lines up. We said, I don't understand. But even if I don't understand, I will hold on to you in faith. What is that? I trust your word. I trust you even when I don't understand. And that's what God is saying. I believe he's calling us as a church. He said, would you trust me and my system over your system right now? Or the world system which you embrace and live for? See, I want us to understand the Bible talks about work and he also talks about rest. Right? Now please track with me. It's not only work. There is work and rest. And there's a balance. And there's a way of doing it. See, firstly, we are designed, right? And we have been instructed to work. We have been designed by God 
an instructor to work. This is why we have two hands and two feet. We have a spine that can bend. I can't still touch my toes, but I can get close. I can still bend and lift up something. I have a back that can carry something. I have hands that can lift. Are you with me? We are designed by God to work. I can move my head. I can look like... You know, an elephant can't lift his head. The elephant is locked. He can't lift. He can only do this with his tongue. He can't look up. An elephant can't look up. Because he is not designed to work. You and I are designed to work. We are designed to work. We are created in the image and likeness of God. So God created man. Genesis chapter 1, 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion. I have blessed you. I have created like you like me. Now get to work. Take what I have given and get to work. See, look at the character of God. Look at that. There are so many scriptures, but I just zoned in on one. Psalm 121, verse, verse 4 to 8. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. God is never saying, thank God or thank myself. He can't thank God, he has to thank himself. I thank myself for giving myself a rest. Watching my people, watching this world. What a lot of hard work for me. Some of those guys every day hear the same thing and do nothing. Look at that fellow, look at that one. Look at, I mean, I would be frustrating God myself. Just me alone would be giving him a headache. And he's like, I wish I can get a break. He's sleeping. Finally, he's sleeping. <laughs> he's sleeping. Now I can get a break. No, but what does it, God who watches Israel, he never sleeps. I sleep. He doesn't sleep. Sometimes as parents, you know, if you have a little child, a little baby who's very hard to handle, Ask a mother with a baby who cries all the time. When they sleep, it's like, thank God. Oh. God doesn't rest. God is constantly at work. Catch this, please. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as, as your protect, protective shade. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and as you go, both now and forevermore. See, the scriptures are countless about how God is constantly working for and then you and I are made in His image and likeness. What do you think that means? See, beloved, take some time to think about these things. Because we are very different from our design. That's why I said this is a pruning day. That's why Jesus says, my word prunes you. He tells His disciples, my word has made you clean or has pruned you up. My word. This is the word of God. Look at this verse, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Right? What does he say? Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. To what? To work and have order. In other words, God created man. Original plan is I want you to work. I, I've made all this. Get to work. Please track with me. Am I spending too much time on working? But it's important. It's important because there is something that has to break in here in all of us. Please. See, we must reverse this mindset. And that's why I'm telling you, parents, if you have little children, don't allow them to hate school. Don't join them when they hate school. What are we doing? We are setting them up to say, yes, holidays are the best thing in your life. Say no. See, what you can do is help them see how that will benefit them. How that has benefited them. See, as parents, we must show them, no, working is not the enemy. Studying is not an enemy. Does this make sense? This is not an enemy. Your holidays are not the best thing ever. No, it's not. Talk to any parent. The holidays are the hardest time having to entertain children. It is not the best thing for a parent. 
If you're working, then you have to find daycare or something. Holiday is not the best thing. But we have to teach them this. Because if we don't teach them, they will become like many of us today. Where us, the holiday is the best thing. See, I don't mind that. But the question is, how does that line up in the way God created you and I? If it doesn't line up, then we're not going to see the fruit of what we are created for. Is this making any sense today? See, that, that whole that mindset has to change. That mindset has to change. Do you know in Sri Lanka? In Sri Lanka, we take the number of holidays we have. Do, do, do you know? I'm just, I did a rough guess, okay? I did a rough guess. We take, we have 104 days from weekends, that's Saturday, Sunday. We have 12 poya days. We have at least seven days for Aurudu. We have another three days for Vesak, right? Because you get the Vesak poya the day after Vesak and the day before and all, all around that there is holidays. At least two days for Christmas. Another at least six to seven days for, for Muslim and Hindu uh, religious holidays, right? And if you're working, you get another 28 days. If you're working, you get an, another 28 days leave. You do. Now those of you who are working for yourself says, I don't get it. Yeah, I do. But I'm talking about general people. In general, if you have a job, you get top of all these holidays, you get another 28 days off. So technically, out of 365 days, you have about 163 days holidays. Close to 160. This is without Corona and lockdown and all. Huh? I'm just talking about a good year, a normal year, not Corona year. Right? So you have about 44% of your year on holidays if you live in Sri Lanka. 44%. And what is the one thing we crave for? More holidays. More holidays. That's become normal, right? That's normal for us. Now, in talking about honoring God, how many of you think by lazing around and lounging around that that glorifies God? How many of us glorify God by lazing around? How many of us can say, okay, today I binged. It was an off day. There was nobody. I had no work. It is my off day, okay? And I can do whatever I want. So I thought of watching this entire TV series from, mo from morning till night. And at the end of the day, how many of you think you glorified God? Ouch! Ow! Ow! If it is out, just pull the knife out. It's okay. This is not to make you feel bad. As I always say, this is not to make you feel bad or send you a guilt trip. But say, listen, if there is something wrong, we need to fix it, right? Yes? That's what we are here for. That's, at least I need to call it out, right? If Two-edged sword. See, think about it. The number of days we have spent and indulged how much of that will glorify God? See, how much of that glorifies God? How much of that, did have, on that day, how much fruit have you born? Out. I chose you and I called you and I have appointed you that you may go and that you may bear fruit on your bed, in your room, with a laptop or a TV. Is that? No, it doesn't say that. See, I'm not trying to send you on a good tree. None of these things are bad on its own. But when that becomes a value, when that becomes a value in your life, then there's something wrong in the biblical system and your system. And you and I are not supposed to have any other system, but one God system. It's our system. Right? You can't, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. That's what James says. <sighs> See, there are some scary scriptures here. The Apostle Paul says, those who don't work shouldn't get to eat. Pastor, that's very harsh. <laughs> I can say this. I'm not Paul. I'm Ignatius. Paul says this in Thessalonians. Why would he say such harsh things? When you go to heaven, you ask him. I will tell you what he said, since he's not around. He says, now dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command. I'm not you. Command. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, stay away from all believers who live idle lives. See, now what I'm trying to talk to you about is this mindset, idle mindset. It's a mindset that says, I want to do nothing. 
I have two good hands, I have two good feet, I have eyesight, I have a good back. But I don't want to do anything. Ayyoh. That mindset, that person. See, there are some of us who don't have two good working legs and two, a good working back, or two good working hands. You don't have proper eyesight. That's not you. I'm talking to the ones who have everything, who have every, who's equipped by God to bear much fruit, but they choose to be idle. Those people, stay away from all believers who live lives, who live idle lives. Don't follow the tradition they receive from. They don't follow the tradition they receive from us. For you know that we, you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. Ouch. We worked hard day and night so that we would not be a burden to any one of you. We certainly had the right to ask for food to feed us. But we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work, meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and to work to earn their own living. Church, let's settle down. Let's settle down. It's time for the church to settle down, as the Apostle Paul is saying. And not get caught with this mindset that the world promotes often. And sometimes we love some of the things it promotes more than the other things. We love this. See, I want us to understand again, those of you who have lost jobs at this time, this is not for you. Those of you who want to work but can't find an opportunity to work, this is not you because your heart is not idle. Your heart wants to work. But somehow the doors haven't opened up for you. Or some door has closed for you. Do not feel condemned. This is not you. But I'm talking about when you have every capacity and opportunity. And you say, no. Such people. Such people. There's another group of people. Don't be upset with me. Well, if you are, too bad. Some of you, you think you are so up there that you can't take a job which is a little lower. You'd rather starve and let your family starve because you can't be humble enough to step down a little from what you were to what you need to do today. Think about it. That's pride. That's pride. You know, I was reading there are 13 today, up to 12, 13 Qantas pilots, pilots of Qantas Airlines in Australia. 13 pilots today who are driving buses. Many of you have seen that video. They're driving buses. They don't care. They say, we need to put food on the table. From the posh guy who drove his, you know, in his suit, in his, you know, pilot kit, to his walk with his bag and everyone. Captain. Now, I'm getting off here. Stop the bus. Ting, ting. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. Because their mindset is, no, I need to work. I'll do whatever I need to take. I need to feed my family. See, there's a mindset. It's a mindset. I believe this has to change. See, what is God's system? What did God tell about work? If we are to bear fruit in work, we need to do what God says. God says this. Guys, work six days. Sorry, sorry, sorry Lord. How, how many days? I've given you seven for a week. You work six. Six days. It's a lot, no Lord. Yeah, but that's my system. Work six, you can rest one day. One day's rest is what you need. So this is God's system. This is not mine, okay? Because I don't really like this system. Right now, my flesh doesn't like God's system. My flesh doesn't like God's system. My flesh likes the other system. I'll work one day, give me six to rest. That's what my flesh would say. But are we people led by the flesh or by the Spirit of God? If you're led by the Spirit of God, there has to be a transformation. Let it change. See Exodus 20. He says, remember the Sabbath. Oh, no, that's a good one. I wonder. Finally, Lord, you're talking holidays. Finally. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your good work. Oh, no, you are. Six days you shall work. This is after the fall, by the way. Huh? 
This is after the fall. He says, after the fall, after the fall, you will work six days still. Oh. How many work days in creation, technically, according to what he says, how many days did God work? He worked six days and he rested one. He says, same, you are made in my image and likeness. You are created to function like me. Do you see that? So the way I function is how you function and you should work like me. Six days, one day rest. And that's what he says. But then he gives us guidelines for what to do on that Sabbath. See, he takes us and tells us what to do on that Sabbath. Right? See, beloved, we are called and we are given the capacity Please hear me again. You and I are given the capacity to work six days. You don't believe it, I don't believe it. But God says, I have given you the capacity to function six days without breaking down and having one day rest a week. Now I did that calculation too. God's calculation is a little different. He gives us 52 days off, not 163 days from the year. He gives us 14%, not 44% holidays. And it seems kind of unfair. It is unfair if you think with the flesh. If you think through the eyes of the Spirit, it's not about an unfair thing. Because in God's kingdom, it is different. See, God wants you to enjoy your rest. Please understand, God wants you to enjoy your rest. God is not against rest. Right? God is not against rest. God wants you to enjoy your rest. However, in the kingdom of God, he says, listen, this is how I want you to enjoy your rest. Right? This is how I want you to enjoy your rest. How is it? Rest day is the day for us to reflect on our six days and to give glory to God. Please track with me. The rest day is, is according to the word of God, is the day where you and I reflect on what happened in the last seven days. It's a day we come and we worship God and we look to Him, a day to share testimonies of the goodness of God. You fed my family. You provided for me. Lord, when there was no this, You gave. I thank You that I was able to work and there was production. Thank You, Lord. That is what we're supposed to do on our rest day. Our rest day, we're supposed to come to Him and as I read, uh, I read a very interesting uh, sta statement that says, On Sundays, workers, mu workers must cease in their calling to do their work. That the Lord by His calling may do His work in them. Right? You and I are supposed to cease from all this other work we do so that God can do a work in us. Can I tell you, if God does a work in you, you will not feel tired from Monday to Saturday. Our problem is, on our rest day, we want to take a rest from God. We do. We and yours want to take a break from God as well. Yes, your body will be refreshed, but your spirit and soul is not refreshed. And your body is not actually what rules and guides you, it's your spirit and soul. And if that is not refreshed, no matter how many holidays you take, the day you go back to work, you're stressed again. That's not God's system. Follow God's system. See, I think this is, this is not just for one person. Or, this is the majority of us, beginning with me. Let's get this system, God's system, working in our lives. God's system working in our lives. Can I tell you, retirement is not biblical? Retirement is not biblical. But pastor, company, the, the, my company retired me. Some of say, the church retired me. Yeah, we function in a system of retirement. That's how it works. The government says this is how it is. Right? So we work in that system. But it doesn't, the retirement is again a mindset. In your mind, you never retire till God takes you home. If you're a believer. There is no retirement. Yes, I stopped working at this institute, but I have not retired. I have stopped working. I don't, I've retired from getting a paycheck, but I'm not retired because I'm still alive. That means God has still work for me on this earth, which I need to fulfill. And can you, I'm speaking to you, retirees, if you don't work, you will get depressed and you will die and you will get sick. He cursed us. No, I didn't curse you. I'm telling you facts. 
I didn't declare that over you. These are facts. The more you keep your mind occupied and you find purpose and value and you start working, right, the less aches and pains you're going to have in your body. Right? The more purpose you'll have, the more grouchy, the less grouchy you will become if you have purpose. And if you learn and have that mindset, it doesn't matter. I'm 80 years old. At 80 years old, I'm not retiring. At 80 years old, God is, Lord, what have you got for me? What have you got for me? See, if you and I can wake up every morning and say, Lord, what is your assignment for me today? What have you got for me? Beloved, he will show you. He will show you. He will show you. See, do you know Jesus worked more than he ever ministered? Jesus worked. Jesus spent 85% of his adult life as a carpenter and a businessman. 85% as a carpenter and a businessman. He didn't set up his little church. He was working. He went around. See, it is believed that Joseph died when he was very, when, when Jesus would have been relatively young. Because the last time you hear about Joseph in the Bible is when Jesus is 12 years old. That's the last time you hear about Joseph. After that, Joseph is out of the picture. Jesus was the firstborn. He was the eldest in that family. Mary and Joseph had other children. But it was his job to provide for his family, for his mother and his brothers and sisters. So he worked. He worked until the Lord said, son, now that work is done. Come, do this. See, I want you to see that. Jesus didn't rest at home saying, I'm going to read the Bible morning, noon and night because I have a great job to do now. No, he worked. He used his hands. He was strong. He worked. He worked. And this is why you and I cannot say, like, where is our example that you have to say, no, but rest is the best thing. No, there is nothing in the Bible that says that. He worked, I believe, from at at least 15 years old. He apprenticed with his father or wherever to be a, a carpenter. And then from that till 30, he worked as a carpenter. He worked. He worked. Out of 132 public appearances, listen to me, please. 122 out of 132 was in the marketplace, was in the business field. That's where he ministered. Only 10, only 10 was in the synagogue or in that area. Everything else was where people are working. That's where he ministered. 52 parables, out of 52 parables, 45 had a workplace context. 45! Who is he talking to? People who work. 45 out of the 52 parables uh, has to do with working. See, please catch this. Sometimes you wonder, how did I miss all this? I don't know. I also missed them. I also missed it. And I'm like, Lord, you have to do a new work in me because, you know, I also love my rest. Like I've told you, my Sunday afternoon nap, don't disturb me. That's gold to me. And I'm like, okay, that's, I don't know, Lord. I'll, I'll work that out with God. I'll tell you what happens, okay? Till such time. Tune in next Sunday and find out. See, Old Testament, New Testament, full of people of God, all of them worked in positions of work. Nobody, nobody, nobody. The only man who wanted to retire was, I've said before, Elijah. He wanted to retire and then God says, okay, then come home. See, the moment you get retirement mindset, the moment you don't have, I don't want to work. Listen, it's very scary. Like I said before, not everyone gets that chariot. There was a chariot sent from heaven once. I have not seen that chariot or heard about it since Elijah. Has anybody else heard about the chariot? No, no. I have not. So, so don't be quick to retire. Don't be quick to retire. Like I've said to some older folk, listen to me. Listen to me, those of you who are getting older and those of you who are a little older. Please track with me on this. If you change your mentality to I don't want to work or do anything more, my question to you is this. How do you want to live this life? Do you want to live this life running as God has called you to or do you want to live this life on a wheelchair or as an invalid on a bed? You choose. Because your mentality, if it is no, I'm telling you, some of us are going to end up on wheelchairs as helpless people, or you're going to end up on a bed if you are not running in the calling God has given you. This is why I love, look at Pastor Leslie, I mean, he's not that old, 
right? But he's much older than I am. He's 15 years, I think, older than me. Man, he is doing way more than any young man could do. I like guys like Pastor Colton, 83 or 84 years old, until the last day, he's running. He's saying, I want to be in hospitals. I want to go to the north and take people and we want to walk through this nation giving the gospel. 84 years old. Yes, he finally died in a hospital bed, but he didn't suffer on a bed doing nothing for years and years and years. Please hear me. Sounds a little harsh, but what to do? See, we have been created. We have been created to produce. Colossians 3 says this, 22 to 24. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them in all, all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of, your, because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember, the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. Please understand like I began, work is a kingdom concept. Working six days and resting one is a kingdom concept. But I want you to understand, when you work with the right attitude, and when you say, no, I want to be productive, when you say, I want to bear fruit, and I'm going to work and give my best, God says, I will reward you. I will reward you. See, there is a reward in heaven system. A reward not a man can give you, but a reward that comes from God which can outmatch any reward the world can give you. And I hope you can see that. Catch it. You know, what's, what, what's ladies, some of the ladies here, what is your famous, productive, woman, power, scripture in the Bible? And that's all of us. Huh? I'm talking about women power. I'm also fearful here. I'm talking about women power. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Read Proverbs 31. The virtuous woman. The industrious woman. See, I, I love this. I was reading this. Her husband can trust her. And if she's not married, it's okay. Right? You don't have to have a husband to be a Proverbs 31 wife. Okay? A woman. Woman. She finds wool and flax and uh, bu uh, bu busily spins it. She is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household, plans the day, works for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field, buys it with her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She plants a vineyard! Not her husband. Oh my, what a, what a woman. What a woman. She is energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread and fingers twisting fiber. Oh, there's a mouthful here. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Reward her. Reward her. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publish. See, I want you to see that. That glorifies God. That glorifies God. Women, ladies, don't think, you know, with this radical feminism, why should I do any of this? No, because God will reward you. God honors you. God says, you be an example. You be an example. That is why you do this. That is why you work. That is why you work. God will reward you, even if nobody else is patting you on the back. Don't stop doing what God says you have the capacity to do based on, no, if they do, I'll do. If they don't do, I will. why should I do? Why the heck should I do? Don't go there. That's not kingdom. That's not kingdom. You are not raised to be that. As a woman of God, you do what God's called to do. God will reward you. God will reward you. Amen? Still here, right? You all haven't gone yet. You haven't switched off, right? Hallelujah. Come on. This is important. See, our work is worship unto God. Our work is worship unto God. Right? I want you to understand that. Now, I want you to see, we need to have a little shift in changing. Can I have that picture? I have a, a quick picture for you to see. See, this is, I'm giving you pictures from ships today. This is a picture of what the church looks like today. And what is that? Our job is to get on board. And then we have a cruise. Baby, there is a swimming pool on top. There is a buffet. And I'm here to stay. This is where I belong. 
This is where I belong. We can start a new song, no? This is where I belong. This is a picture that many people have of church. This is church. I got on board. I'm on board, baby. And I'm just going to have a cruise. This is where it all happens. But this is not the church of Jesus Christ. Can we see the next picture? The next picture. This is more like the church. What happens on this one? Ladies, some of you have no idea, but this is called an aircraft carrier. In this, you see the aircraft? They fly out, and then they fly back in. They don't stay for the cruise. They are on that to be equipped so they can go out and do what they're supposed to do. Then they fly back in and they're equipped. See, I don't know how good an example this is, but I think get that into your head. That's, that, that's church. Church is where you come. You land here on a Sunday. And you get some equipment done. You get those extra you know, ammunition put into your wings, your bombs, your payload, your fuel. And then you fly out. You're not on a cruise. Church is not a cruise. Break the cruise mindset. See, that has to break. See, I want us to understand. Break the secular versus sacred mindset. To a Jewish man and a woman, there was nothing called secular and sacred. Everything they did was sacred unto God. It is the Greek thinking, the Greek teaching that separated sacred and secular. Not the Hebrew. Right? Not he God's people never came up with sacred and secular. For them, everything we do, whether I am a planter, whether I have a vineyard, whether I have look after sheep, no matter what I do, it is holy unto God. That's why they bought the first fruits of whatever they did unto God. What I do is holy and I'm going to give him my best sheep. I worked, I produced and God gets my best. You see that? So there was no secular and sacred. That's something that came on later. Now think about this. Right? Where did the gospel, where did the gospel go um, after the apostles? Right? It went to Europe. Right? It went to Europe. It went all over the world. But the ones who caught hold of it from the time of Constantine was Europe. How did Europe become first world countries when their history and culture is far less than Asia? We boast of a 2,000 year old culture. The Chinese can say the same or more. The Indians. Why is it China is now not a third world country, but till not so long ago? Why did Asian countries who had histories, cultures, I mean, come on, you go to Sigiri, you see what our guys are capable of doing, right? But why are we a third world country? Why are those Westerners who have really very little history behind them? Why are they first world countries? Because I believe, this is something I read, and I believe is this, is because they adopted the Christian work ethic. The Christian work ethic made them first world countries. The Christian work ethic. Why did you just become the most powerful nation in the world? It may not be anymore. But for the longest of time, they had a Christian work ethic. They said, we build our nation on God. In their money, it says, in God we trust. Trust me, they will change that statement. You wait and see. I'm not a prophet of doom. I'm telling you, that statement will be removed very soon. In God we trust might change if people have their agenda. God is not in the U. He's not welcome, really. Anyway, that's not my business. But, I want, but do you see this? When you and I function with a good Christian work ethic, right? we go from third world, we can become first world. Just imagine if Sri Lanka has Christians who are with a Christian godly work ethic. Can you imagine the, in, the transformation you and I can do to this nation? The impact we will have. The example we will be. See, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you know one of the first times that the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being on a person? Exodus 3, 31. 2 to five, uh, 5 says this, I have chosen Bezalel Bezal of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, 
expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver and bronze. He is a master at everything. What was he? What, what, what spirit did he do? How many sermons did he preach? He didn't preach a single sermon. The Spirit of God came about him so he can do the work brilliantly. The Spirit of God comes upon his people so they can work brilliantly. That the world looks and says, this guy is a master. Nah? He's a master without a master's. He's a master without a master's. He's a master without a degree. He's a master without, I don't know what kind of education this fellow had. In fact, I was having a chat with a businessman last week. And he said, Pastor, I can't believe I'm, again, I, I don't know. I, every time I've just taught it, God has blessed me, my business. I'm able to give increments. I'm able to give bonuses to people in the midst of COVID. And he said, Pastor, I have no education. How is this possible? I said, you bear fruit in your assignment. Because he will give you all what you need. Even though you don't have degrees from here, there and everywhere. You have him. And if his assignment is for you, through this business to bring glory to him and be a blessing to others, my goodness, it will flourish. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? He said, how is this possible? How is this possible? Hallelujah. See, I'm going to close with this. I know Seri has waved now twice. And saying, enough, Dada, stop it. Right. My productivity, please understand, your productivity and your fruitfulness is not limited to you. And this is something I want us to catch today. It's not limited to you. My fruitfulness and productivity blesses generations. It blesses generations. See, First Timothy 5, 8, If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of the household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If you are not providing for your people, for your household, for your, the, the people above you and below you, it says you're worse than an unbeliever. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for, his, up for the righteous. What is he saying? See, when you look at this, you say, oh my gosh, I'm honestly, I don't own any houses, so I'm like, How, Lord, I can never leave houses for three children. I have three also on top of that. If I had one even, could have worked something out. How do I find three houses? Won't happen. This is not about wealth. It's not limited to wealth. It is what can I give them if I don't have wealth? What do I have? Well, I have an inheritance that comes from God. So I can teach them the word of God. I can teach them to live for God. And that inheritance can go from them to the next generation, to the next generation. Then I have done what God has given me to do. What do I have? What do I have? You are created for this, beloved. Beloved. You are created, but you are created God's system. Work six days, rest one day. Listen, it's not about working six days in your company, right? If your company says or your office says you work for so many days, but in the next day and the next two days, don't put your legs up and say, oh, no, even that day, look, how can I be productive today? It is my off day. How can I be productive today, Lord? What can I do? If it's at home, do some work. Make your garden look good. Make your house look clean. No, but it's my off day. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to change my clothes. I don't know. Just saying, what if God turns up in your bedroom? Sorry, Lord, I'll change now, okay? I'll change. Be productive, guys. Be productive. Be productive. Perhaps very specially, I want to talk to you, um, younger generation. Younger generation. See, I want you to know something God gave me um, yesterday. Yesterday I was, uh, I wanted Seri to come and do something. Uh, it was about learning something from the uh, uh, program we were doing and uh, she was making excuses. She said, no, but if, if, I, if I come to listen and watch this, then, then this can't be done and that can't, because she's a good organizer. So she said, no, I don't organize. I said, Enough. You're not organizing anything. Sit down and learn. Okay. And she sat down. And then I was like, it's, I was a little annoyed. So I was a little harsh. I was like, Lord, how do I explain this to her? How do I explain this? And the Lord gave me something, which I share, want to share with all of you young people. Listen, we, different generations, we are the now. We are the now. God has placed me here now. I don't know where I'll be in 15 years' time in 10 years time but I know I am now all of us 
are now. You who are watching, I don't know what your age is, but you are now. But you younger people, you are the now and tomorrow. You are the now and the future. And if you don't, if you don't get the concepts of God and start working like in the kingdom of God, now, when it is your complete time, when we are gone away and it is all yours, you'll have to start from scratch. God does not want you to start from scratch. He wants you to stand on shoulders of an older generation and build from there. Not start again building foundation. No. Have the same foundation now. So when you build, you don't build on scratch. You don't go back and dig foundations. But you stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before you. Of those who set things up. Of those who build a little platform. But to do that, you have to change your work ethic, which majority of you have, is to sit behind a screen where that is the most enjoyable thing in life. This is not from God. Again, I'm not pointing fingers. Please hear me. Something has to shift. Where you're conscious. You're conscious of wastage. You're conscious of, of, of what you have been given. That you are a good steward of all the resources. Like I tell my children, a simple thing. Knock the light off. Knock that light off. Somebody has to pay. Somebody is paying. When you walk out of your room and there's a fan and a light and, and something else on, somebody has to pay for that. Be conscious. Be conscious. Seri is waving that red stick saying, enough, stop now. Okay, I'll stop now. But I want you to get this. I'm, I'm not joking. I'm being serious here. You all are not tomorrow. You all are not the future. You all are the today. And the future. I am not the future. I am today. I don't know if you heard that. I am for today. That you are for today with me. But you are also the future. I am not the future. You are. You decide what, what the future is going to look like in the kingdom of God. You decide. I can't decide. You have to decide. Amen. Amen. So let's get this work ethic of saying, Lord, I'm going to bear fruit where you have placed me. I'm going to bear fruit. I'm going to come and when I take my holiday, I want to replenish. Now there's a lot of work here because there's a massive shift that is required, right? There is a massive shift. Don't throw this out and say, no, I was doing fine all this time. This sermon I don't need. <laughs> I said, why am I saying this? Because if you are pruned by this, you will bear more fruit. If you can do what God is saying, I guarantee you, you will bear more fruit than what you're bearing right now. Don't be satisfied with 10% when God is 100. Hallelujah.